Well, I'm glad you guys are in the audience. Please, it's going to feel a lot less strange. <laughs> you tell us when we are. Hello, everybody here in the room and online. Um, this is a CDI um, seminar. CDI started 10 years ago. Um, it works as a community of practice of people interested in exploring new methods for um, impact evaluations. Um, it started very much with discussions about uh, methods, but increasingly in the last years, there is a um, uh, yeah, sort of a consensus between most of the people in the, in the community of practice that all methods are parts of packages of methods, so mixed method um, designs, and that the research is um, focused on, on key questions in, in the theory of change. So I'm very pleased today to uh, have uh, Julia here to um, discuss randomized control trials as part of a mixed method design. Um, it has been uh, the, the, the scapegoat uh, often in our debates about um, methods um, because RCTs is, is considered the golden standard and especially the community of practices was, was established to think about alternative ways to uh, inform uh, causality and to, uh, uh, and to, to assess <coughs> effectiveness of uh, com uh, complex interventions. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this um, presentation. Um, please, the online audience, uh, use the chat function. When you have questions, we will monitor the, the chat and then I'll, I'll chair after the presentation and select some, some questions from you. And if it is possible and you feel um, to it, uh, we can also have you uh, speak it and, and ask it directly in the, in the session. Thank you, Julian. The floor Thank to you. you. Thank you, Gil, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk today about RCTs, and I'm going to do that using two examples of recent um, RCTs we run in the field of uh, tax compliance. Both of them are in Rwanda. Um, so these are the two papers I will discuss. Um, So here they are. Um, I'm the one presenting, but this is uh, co-authored uh, work with uh, uh, my colleagues uh, who are named there on the slide and uh, and others. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the two uh, RCTs. Uh, the first one is called Tax Compliance in Rwanda, uh, Evidence from a Message Field Experiment. The second one is called Active Ghosts, and it's going to become a little bit clearer what these active ghosts are in a in a in a moment, and then I'm going to reflect a little bit and use those two examples to uh, reflect on the RCTs as a method, their limitations, and how they can interact with other methods, as uh, as Gil said. Um, so let me start with a bit of a motivation for this work. Um, there is a large and um, growing literature on tax compliance. Uh, largely asking why do people comply or why do people evade, uh, evade taxes? And the answer is usually in one of two big categories of factors. One is deterrence, that includes sanctions, audits, um, even the tax rate itself, the level of penalties and so on. And the other one is tax morale, that includes uh, fairness of the tax system, equity, trust in the government, but also fiscal exchange. I pay taxes, what do I get uh, in return uh, of it? More recently, there is uh, an increasing literature showing that in addition to deterrence and tax morale, compliance costs are also an important element to explain uh, tax compliance. Compliance costs are all the costs associated with trying to do things right when you're uh, uh, filing and preparing your tax return. Many of us will have examples from our own experience or family and friends. Uh, these are things like understanding what exactly do you need to pay, uh, when do you need to file your returns, which taxes you're liable for, what is your tax base, and so on. 
we're going to discuss a little bit about that uh, in the second RCT. Um, to answer those broader questions about tax compliance, in the last 20 years or so, researchers have started using field experiments. Uh, the first one was run in the US uh, in the early 2000s, um, and, uh, and since then they've been expanding in, in various contexts. Before field experiments were used in this literature, the studies that were looking at tax compliance were largely theoretical or observational, or if they were experimental, they were using lab experiments. A lab is usually in this context, a room at a university with students in it, presented with some scenarios, and then some questions about what would you do in this situation. There's obvious limitations because what a student says they will do when they are in, in a lab, in a lab setting, is not necessarily how they would behave. And also many of those participants didn't have any experience with tax paying to start with. So it was informative, but there were clear limitations. On the other hand, field experiments allow the observation of taxpayer behavior in real life. So uh, the goal is exactly to observe real firms, real individuals, as they deal with their tax paying um, uh, process through the data that comes through from their declarations. Generally, this literature finds that deterrence is quite effective. The results on tax morale are a lot more mixed, but we're going to discuss a little bit more about it because uh, of course that is related to one of the limitations of these methods uh, uh, as well. Now, the vast majority of this literature is from higher income countries. Um, and in fact, before this, the first study I'm presenting today, there was no field experiment in any African country or in any lower income country. Um, and this was an important gap because it wasn't just possible to take the results from higher income countries and translate them in lower income contexts for a number of reasons. One of them being that those two key groups of determinants of tax compliance apply very differently in a lower income context. Think about deterrence. In a context where administrative capacity is quite weak, it's not only about sending a message about deterrence here and the sanctions, it's about how credible is that threat or that message. And if it is not credible, then we can't expect a, a very large impact as we would in a, in a context where the threat can actually be followed through with actual checks and actual sanctions. And similarly, when it comes to tax morale, much of this literature uses uh, sort of encouraging messages like, most taxpayers comply with taxes, join the compliant majority. But what if in your context, there isn't a compliance majority and actually people know that many uh, uh, people are sometimes beyond uh, a small minority don't comply with taxes, then that message is really not gonna deliver the impact it's supposed to, it's supposed to deliver. But also in this context, can we expect simple nudges to actually do the job? And this is true everywhere, not only lower income countries. There is a broader debate about how can we, how, how can we expect nudges to be uh, effective in, in, uh, in affecting human behavior, which is such a complex, uh, complex thing. And it's a debate that we can have later. But in this context, uh, it's about tax compliance when the issues are so massive. Can a simple message help? We didn't know uh, before this study and others that have been run after this. Uh, but also what is the best way to reach out to taxpayers? Because this literature largely relies on messages delivered by letters. But what we know uh, is that in many lower income countries, it's not that easy to actually find people using an address. Uh, letters, physical letters are not actually used to communicate with people. So that is definitely, that method needed to be adapted uh, somehow. But also more broadly, is, that, is it enough to just stop at deterrence and tax morale? And of course it's not. And especially in the second study, I'm, I'm going to talk a lot more about the complexity of those interactions between taxpayers and tax administration and how other methods are needed to actually capture it. Um, uh, and, and, and definitely it's, it's not enough to stop at RCTs to, to capture that complexity. So the key results of these two studies that I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on in the next, uh, uh, in the next few minutes are, well, the first one is that those simple nudges actually work. So one of the questions was, do they even work in this context? The, the answer is yes, they do. Um, they increase tax compliance by 55%, which is a very big uh, effect. That translates in 6 million um, extra revenue, uh, US dollars, for the government uh, of Rwanda, as opposed to a cost of sending those messages of, of about $4,000. Uh, so faring quite well on cost effectiveness uh, there. In terms of the contents of the messages, what we found is that friendlier approaches are much more effective than deterrence. Despite those results being um, uh, encouraging, 
uh, on the useful, usefulness of nudges, they are definitely not enough to understand compliance. So uh, we also looked at the longer term effectiveness. We found that there isn't any long term effect. So yes, there is a nudge, there is an impact, but that everything goes back to normal after that. So of course, in terms of policy, we need to do something more. But also there are many taxpayers who are largely unaffected by those nudges. And they are specific kinds of taxpayers that we call active ghosts. And that's where we then went on to study those taxpayers specifically. But also what we found out is that the practice of uh, taxpaying matters. So whatever our theories of tax compliance, whatever our hypothesis, there is a whole set of other issues that matter that come out, especially in the second of these studies through the qualitative interviews that I'm going to discuss a second. And they have to do with those interactions between taxpayers and tax administrators in practice. So let me go through the first study now. That was a preview of results. Uh, let's dive in the first, uh, the first one. And I want to tell you a little bit how these studies look like in general, because the, the design is actually very similar across countries. We, we ad adapted it uh, to the context of Rwanda. But the basic idea is that we want to test theories on drivers and obstacles to tax compliance. And as I said, these are mostly about deterrence and tax morale. They are called field experiments because they are done with actual data from tax declarations. So these are records that tax administrations in every country collect anyway in the process of collecting and administering taxes. That means also that they cover the full population of taxpayers, of firms and individuals who are registered with the tax administration. They of course exclude informal firms. So those firms that are not registered with the tax administration are not in the sample because they don't pay taxes and therefore the records are not uh, at the tax administration. The method is very simple. It's a randomized controlled trial, uh, just the same method that we would use to test the effectiveness of a drug or a vaccine. And the intervention in this case is not to give a drug or a shot of a, a vaccine, is, to, uh, is an informational intervention. So it's a message with some information on it. It is typically an official letter with a stamp from the revenue authority signed by the head of the revenue authority, which gives information either about sanctions or about what tax revenue is used for and so on. It's important to say that it's only information. So actually the letter is not changing any of the parameters of the tax system itself. It's not changing the level of sanctions. It's not changing the probability that somebody will get audited. And it's not changing how tax revenue is actually spent. It just gives additional information to taxpayers. That's all it does. And the outcome, we want to see if that message affects the tax liability as captured in the administrative records. So this is the standard design and it's been applied to uh, several contexts. We applied it in Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda is a lower income country. Um, the tax ratio is about 15%, uh, which is about the level that uh, some international organizations are identifying as the minimum to actually have a functioning government. Um, as opposed to other lower income countries, Rwanda has widespread coverage of public services. In fact, it's one of the countries in Africa with the wider coverage of public health insurance. Um, and also it's a country, for those of you who know the history of the country a little bit, that has a very strong government rhetoric on self-reliance, which has uh, implications for taxation because of course relying on domestic revenue is um, very much in line with self-reliance as opposed to uh, um, relying on external sources of funding, like for example, aid or debt. It's also a country with very effective institutions and strong internal accountability within organizations. Uh, and this is important because for the implementation part, that really helped us making sure that the RCT was implemented um, in a way that would allow the evaluation afterwards. Said that, Rwanda still faces many of the challenges of lower income countries. Uh, informality is, is quite widespread. Administrative capacity is still quite weak. Um, and of course, there are broader challenges around uh, economic and democratic uh, development in the country, as I'm sure many of us know. So in this paper, what we do is uh, we implemented a large scale field experiment along the lines that I just described. And we tried to test, actually we tested two drivers of tax compliance. One is uh, related to deterrence and more specifically, we gave information about uh, sanctions for evasion. The second one is related to tax morale within the broader uh, umbrella concept and all the uh, various concepts within it, we chose fiscal exchange exactly because in Rwanda, uh, public services are uh, something that is quite widespread. Many people have access to at least healthcare and other services. And we thought that was particularly fitting in that, uh, in that context. So we focused on fiscal exchange. 
As opposed to other studies in the literature, we have tested also multiple delivery methods. Um, and there are practical reasons and theoretical reasons to do that. The practical reason is you can't get very far with letters because they're not used, because addresses are very imprecise. The theoretical reason is it might be that actually taxpayers internalize a different perception uh, and probability of being caught depending on the cost of the method. So in a context where letters are not used, if the government takes the trouble of sending me a letter, finding me at my premises and actually delivering the letter, it might give a perception that actually they're after me. Whereas an SMS or, a, or an email, which are the other uh, two uh, methods we're using, might not actually yield the same, the same kind of reaction. So there's practical and theoretical reasons to expect a different um, uh, impact there. What we did is translated those hypotheses in our treatments. Uh, so we have three treatments related to message content. They all start with a reminder of deadlines. So the first treatment is just a reminder uh, of the deadlines, and that's our control message. We also have a reminder plus a deterrence message and a reminder plus a fiscal exchange message. I'll show you how they look like in a second. And all three message contents are delivered with three delivery methods, letters, emails, and SMS. So that when we interact, uh, all of them, we have uh, 10 groups, nine treatment groups, each content delivered by each method, and one control group where the control group receives nothing. So we have both a control message that only includes the reminder and a no message control group. And this is important because in a context, again, it speaks to the difference between lower and higher income countries. In a context where the revenue authority doesn't often get in touch with taxpayers, even just the fact of receiving a message might make a difference, regardless of what you write in the message. So it was important to have like a neutral message in addition to any content to it to just identify is it the content or just the fact of receiving any message. So I'm going to go quickly on data and sample. As I said, we use the administrative data from the revenue administration that includes all taxpayers that are registered for the corporate income tax. So these are all firms. Um, we had to apply some eligibility criteria because even though we were working with uh, SMS and emails, in addition to physical addresses, we wanted to make sure that we could reach these people, which meant we had to exclude some. Um, and then we randomly allocated the eligible sample across the 10 groups. So that's the basis of the randomized control trial um, method where the 10 groups are the same before the intervention because we allocated participants randomly to, to the groups. And the randomization was successful as we can check with the standard balance tests. Because this wasn't done before, not only in Rwanda, but in any lower income country, we did a pilot. And it was actually uh, with our colleagues from the Rwanda Revenue Authority. We still remember that very clearly because for the pilot, we only had uh, letters and there were letters everywhere. There were like 2000 uh, letters at the time. Um, and this was really not something that the Rwanda Revenue Authority had ever done uh, on this scale. Uh, they were sending, of course, letters when there was a specific reason, like an audit or a check, but not to communicate with taxpayers. So it was very complex to even organize that, which confirmed our hunch that actually we needed to experiment with other methods as well. Uh, but they were great uh, as they've done, uh, as they've been throughout the collaboration, and they we managed to implement the pilot. We learned a lot from it, and then we went on uh, a lot more confidently to actually implement the main experiment, which involved sending messages now to 9,000 taxpayers. So it was important to make sure we had the implementation right before we did that. And again, another limitation of RCTs is that they can easily go wrong when the implementation goes wrong. So either if the implementing agency doesn't have the capacity to implement, if there are practical challenges that mean it's simply not possible to do what the intervention is supposed to do, uh, then there's, there's no point even trying to evaluate the impact because, um, because the, the intervention is just not doing what it's supposed to do because of implementation challenges. Um, so each taxpayer around uh, January, March 2016 received only one of our messages and they received it at the time when they were preparing their declarations. So uh, they had three months at the end of the year. So the fiscal year ends uh, in December, 31st of December. From the 1st of January, they have until 31st of March to file their declarations. And that is the time when we nudge them because they were actually doing that. They were preparing to submit their declarations. Um, the letters and the emails were exactly identical. All of them were sent through RRA official channel, channels, which meant uh, they had a stamp, 
they were signed by the Commissioner General, um, and they were all identical except for a couple of uh, sentences. So this is a sample letter. Uh, you can see there, uh, that is the reminder letter, and it's just uh, saying the RA would like to inform you that your return is due by this date. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, here is the uh, phone number for the call center. And then it ends with a wish for the next financial year. Uh, thank you for your contributions and uh, have a good and prosperous uh, 2016. Um, and there is a translation in Kine Rwanda at the bottom, so it's English and Kine Rwanda. So I'm just gonna show you the deterrence one because it's exactly the same. The same text that I just mentioned is also repeated here, but now there is um, a couple more sentences there uh, which say, do you know that if you do not uh, declare and pay your taxes on time, the RRA might find and potentially prosecute you. And then we use a slogan that the RRA was already using at the time, which says, pay your taxes on time and avoid uh, fines and penalties. And then we put the justice hammer there to uh, sort of uh, drive home the, the message. And similarly, uh, again, this is the same. Now the picture is no longer the justice hammer. It's a, it's a picture coming from the Minister of Finance and it's showing where the money is going in terms of public expenditure. And again, the message is the same, but the couple of sentences are now not about sanctions, they are about public services. And again, we use one of Rwanda, uh, the RRA slogans, which at the time was, pay your taxes, build, build Rwanda, be proud. Um, and the same uh, goes with the translation in two languages and the purple stamp and uh, the signature of the commissioner general. Okay. So um, the letters and emails were identical. The SMS were necessarily a little bit shorter. I'm not gonna show you the messages, but the idea is the same. Um, and all messages were personalized. This is important. Actually, it took quite some time to develop the platform to do that because even the SMS that the RA was sending at the time, they were saying, dear taxpayer, or your return is due. But what we wanted is, dear Gil, your return is due. And that we know from behavioral science that makes it makes a difference. So we, we really wanted to do that and we managed to uh, develop a platform that is still used to this day uh, to, to, to do that. Of course, the research pro project had to be kept confidential. What we didn't want uh, is for taxpayers to know that those letters were part of a research study because they might have not reacted to it. They might have thought, well, this is just, this is just a study. They might have disregarded them. So we made sure that even within the revenue administration, only the, research, uh, the researchers in the research function knew that this was um, an evaluation. And then of course, later it was known, there, it was talked about in TV, uh, the radio, th there was nothing secret about it, but it was important during the evaluation that taxpayers didn't know it was a study. So this is our um, empirical framework, which I'm not gonna go into much detail. What we're interested in is the beta um, uh, coefficients, uh, which are, there are nine of them for the nine treatments. Uh, we also uh, controlled for a number of relevant variables, and we estimated uh, this equation, both with OLS and Tobit, uh, because this is a censored variable tax, and we estimated both intention to treat and treatment untreated. But this is the level of detail I don't necessarily need to go uh, into because I'm not actually showing you tables today. If you want to see them, I have them. Uh, but I want to go straight to the main results. And the main results are, are these. First, the reminder, which is the control message, was really the most effective treatment. And this confirmed our hunch that again, in this context where there isn't much communication, there isn't much personalized communication, the fact of just receiving a message already makes a difference. And this is also confirmed in other studies in the literature. The fiscal exchange message, it was quite interesting because it did uh, yield a significant impact but the impact was not additional to the reminder. So it was just the same, but also it was mostly effective by, by SMS and not with the other methods. And we've spent quite a lot of time trying to figure out why is it that the same message sent through SMS is, uh, is, has an impact and through letters and emails uh, doesn't. And one of the things that we have thought about, I mean, really the, the only explanation that we could come up with is that the SMS didn't have a graph. So maybe taxpayers didn't like what they saw in the graph. And in fact, if you go in um, many countries, ministries of finance websites, and you find a breakdown uh, of public expend expenditure, you will often find that there is quite a big chunk called general services or uh, you know, um, 
general, uh, like a, sort of a, a general heading. And for somebody who doesn't uh, necessarily uh, know what's in there uh, or, um, or might not like to see such a general heading uh, taking up 30% of the budget, that might actually have backfired. Or maybe they saw an allocation of, uh, of public expenditure that is not in line with what they would have preferred to see. So that is what we, uh, that is what we have um, uh, hypothesized as an explanation, but we didn't manage to, uh, to explore it in, in practice. Um, deterrence uh, was never significant. So our deterrence message never came up statistically significant. And in fact, the coefficient is even lower than the reminder. Because what, we, what you would expect to see is if deterrence is, uh, um, has, a, has an impact on taxpayers, you would expect to see not only a significant coefficient, but also a coefficient that is higher than the reminder, because you have the reminder plus the deterrence. So even in the case of fiscal exchange, there was no additional impact of fiscal exchange. In the case of deterrence, it, it even goes back. It's even lower the impact, although it's not statistically significant. But that's where we started thinking, is there even a backfiring effect? So is deterrence not only ineffective, but actually leading taxpayers to comply even less? And, um, and I'm gonna tell you the answer to that question in a second. Uh, the last thing I wanna say on main results is that non-traditional delivery methods were highly effective. In fact, they were more effective than letters, even once we include the implementation challenges of sending letters. So of course, uh, out of 100 letters, only 40 actually were delivered, whereas that uh, number is much higher for uh, SMS and emails. But even taking that into account, SMS and emails were, were much more impactful than letters. Now, back to the backfiring effect uh, question. There are studies in the literature that suggest that those kind of deterrence messages might backfire, particularly amongst larger taxpayers. Now, larger taxpayers are, of course, very different than smaller taxpayers on a number of uh, variables. One of them being, they know exactly what they're doing when they're filing taxes. They're not confused about their tax uh, payments and processes. If they are, they can pay people who help them and help them minimize their taxes. So, um, and in fact, this is often a challenge for revenue authorities because often the resources that larger taxpayers have to minimize their tax burden are much higher than the resources that the tax authority has to go, uh, to go after them. So we tried to check if maybe that was what it was explaining our results. And to do that, we repeated our analysis, uh, but we now excluded the top 10% of taxpayers, meaning the largest 10% of taxpayers we dropped and we repeated on the rest of the sample. And, uh, and in this case, deterrence becomes highly significant. So amongst those smaller taxpayers, the coefficient on deterrence is highly statistically significant. It is larger than the reminder, as we would expect. Uh, and the result is the same, whether we take uh, out of the sample the top 10%, the top 3%, the top 5%, or LTO, which stands for Large Taxpayer Office. Uh, office. So taxpayer registered there, um, uh, the result is, uh, is always the same. And also descriptively, this result is, is confirmed. So basically, there is a backfiring effect, particularly amongst larger taxpayers that did not like the current treatment. We even have anecdotal stories of actually taxpayers coming into the revenue authority and demanding to see the commissioner general and asking, why are you coming? And why are you asking me this? I'm complying. You know, what, what, what should I do? And, uh, and how, how do you dare actually coming and uh, coming after me? And in some cases, it, there was a, a very easy resolution. In some cases, there was also a very um, positive resolution in the sense that maybe there was actually an issue with the taxpayer accounts that the RRA officer in charge at, at that point was able to help with. Because remember, the letters were sent regardless of the situation of taxpayers. So at the time we sent the letters, we didn't know if there was any wrongdoing at all, which is why the letters don't say you are evading and you're going to be liable for um, penalties. It just says, here are the penalties. So some additional questions and results. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, there are no effect, longer term effects. So we went back the following year to see if those taxpayers who were nudged were still complying more in the second year after the intervention. The answer is no. They went back to doing what they were doing. So there was no learning. It was just a simple nudge. And that was all. Uh, was it worth it? Uh, I already mentioned at the beginning, the total revenue gain was about $6 million, $6 as opposed to $4,000 to implement uh, these, including staff costs and everything. So it was uh, definitely cost effective. A broader question for the tax compliance literature is, 
is tax compliance just not working? And, and here really it's important to keep in mind that RCTs test one specific thing. They don't test if tax morale matters or not for tax compliance. They test whether a letter mentioning public services can do something to improve uh, tax compliance. The answer to that question is probably not, but it doesn't mean that tax morale is not, uh, is not helpful more broadly. Um, but also many taxpayers did not respond to the treatment at all. And this is about half of our sample. We didn't see any uh, change at all. Uh, and many of those are firms with zero tax liability. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna discuss those a lot more in the next 10 minutes or so, because they are the active goals we then focused on in a follow-up study. So just to conclude on this one RCT with some policy uh, implications, uh, what I'm learning from this uh, and what we've been discussing with the RRA is nudging is definitely a, an effective tool in the tax administrators, in tax administrators toolkit. Friendly approaches in particular are quite useful. This is something that the uh, Revenue Authority of Rwanda was very receptive to because they were already adopting an approach uh, much more focused on promoting voluntary, voluntary compliance uh, than, uh, than enforcement. But there are big questions about what happens in the longer term. So yes, you can nudge taxpayers, something is gonna happen immediately, but that is not enough for policymakers. What are they gonna do next year? Do they have to keep nudging them? And what happens when taxpayers see that they receive a message every year, but actually nothing happens? There's no follow-up, real action. That can actually even undermine the credibility of the institution. And this is where, again, RCTs need to be taken with a bit of a pinch of salt, because yes, we've learned something, but uh, uh, there are also dangers to keep doing uh, the same thing over and over. Uh, and, um, and in fact, one shouldn't expect that the same results should, uh, should keep presenting itself. In fact, those kind of nudges should be complemented with other kinds of interventions. Um, in our case, we then went on to study taxpayer education um, that are more likely to actually have deeper um, implications for, for behavior and longer, and longer lasting implications. And in fact, in that study on taxpayer education, we show that there is an impact and that impact lasts over time because this is a bit more of a structure, structured and in-depth intervention than just a simple message. Um, okay, I'm now moving to the second uh, RCT. This is gonna be a lot quicker uh, because you uh, have already heard a lot about uh, uh, the method and, uh, um, and the key issues. Um, so what I need to do at the beginning is to define those nil filers. Um, those nil filers or active ghosts are firms that are registered with the tax administration, but they declare zero in all fields. So they declare zero income, zero expenses, zero tax, zero everything. It is a really widespread phenomenon. About half of all corporate income tax declarations in Rwanda are new. So this means that um, those, uh, those taxpayers produce zero revenue for the tax administration, but also importantly, they produce zero information. We just know that they exist. We know that what their taxpayer identification number is, and that's, and that's all. This is not only a massive phenomenon in Rwanda, it's also a very large phenomenon elsewhere. So there is evidence from Uganda, Ethiopia, Zwatini, Nigeria, Malawi, and other countries that this kind of taxpayer with zero everything, zero income, zero tax, is, is actually taking up a big proportion of the, uh, of the population of registered firms. On this particular population, the previous RCT found zero impact. And we were a bit puzzled because we weren't quite sure. We weren't quite sure why we weren't, we weren't finding any impact from the RCT, but also more broadly, we weren't quite sure why people would register with the tax administration and then declare zero. Because if you, if you intend to evade, then why register with the tax administration in the first place? You can just stay uh, under the radar. But then if the information is genuine and they're actually making no income, then why are they in business um, to start with? And why are they even registered anyway? Because they, it looks like they're not operating. And the tax compliance literature is really silent on we had no explanation. What we could do is, um, is go out to uh, our colleagues from the Rwanda Revenue Authority in this case and ask them, why do you think this is happening? And they gave us two hypotheses. Um, one is that nil filings are tax evaders. They declare zero, they should declare something, but they're just evading all of their taxes. 
The second one is that nail filers are registered with the tax authority, but what they should really do is deregister. The reason why they don't do that is that processes to do so are so complex that they'd rather just keep filing zero and uh, rather than go through the hoops to, um, to deregister from, uh, from the Rwanda Revenue Authority. So we had two testable hypotheses. We went on to run the second RCT to, um, to see if there was uh, any truth in them or if they were actually confirmed in the, in the data. The design is the same random allocation to the treatment groups. Uh, in this case, we only used the SMS because we knew from the previous experiment that that was the most effective uh, delivery method anyway. But this time we target messages specifically at nail filers, meaning that we tell them, last year you reported zero income in your corporate income tax declaration. And then we add our usual treatment messages, one related to deterrence. If you underreport your income, you can be fine, avoid penalties, and one related to deregistration. Do you need to deregister? It can only take three days. And that was true. A few months before, the process was changed. So it went from taking three or four different steps at the National Revenue Authority and then the local branch and then the private sector federation, which is the business association. It went from that to being a much simpler thing that in three days could be, uh, could be done with. So we included that information. That information hadn't been communicated yet to taxpayers. So we did that in, in this experiment. And as before, the treatment messages were evaluated against a control message and the pure control, uh, control group with no message at all. So what we find? We find that um, nil filing decreases after the treatment, but not by much. And similarly, deregistration increases after the treatment. So the treatment does something to nudge those taxpayers to deregister, but not by much. So the effect is one percentage point or 2.5 percentage points over the control group mean statistically significant, but economically really quite non-consequential. So our conclusion from this RCT was, well, there is definitely some truth in both hypotheses that came up from tax officials, but they do not provide a, 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 a comprehensive explanation because the vast majority of new filers just keep doing what they were doing before despite our messages. And mind you, we know that those messages can be effective because for the other taxpayers, they were very effective. So this is not a problem with the method. It's not that they couldn't be nudged because then we would need to have a theory on why name filers can't be nudged while other taxpayers can be nudged. So in this case, we went on to uh, do qualitative interviews uh, with uh, 30 taxpayers who were randomly selected amongst the nail filers in country and uh, with 24 tax officials from various departments. Um, and this was on top of various informal conversations that we had been having over the years with our colleagues from the Rwanda Revenue Authority. So what we found uh, from this qualitative analysis is, uh, is this. First, nil filing is a conscious behavior. We were worried that it might be a mistake in the data uh, or that there might be a reason so that these taxpayers didn't even know that this was how their tax records were showing up. That wasn't the case. They knew. Um, that uh, they were registered, and in the great majority of cases, they had registered hoping that their business would take off, and the business never never did take off. Um, and then once they are registered, they didn't deregister, or either because they were hopeful for new opportunities, or because they were scared that somebody would audit them if they deregistered. Um, perhaps the most important result coming out from those interviews is that Maybe the biggest reason behind the presence of so many nil filers is those massive registration campaigns from the Rwanda Revenue Authority. These campaigns can be quite aggressive. Uh, it can either be door to door uh, to actually go out and assign team numbers, or in one case, uh, the Rwanda Revenue Authority actually registered everybody who had a trading license, assigned a taxpayer identification number to them. This was over 50,000 taxpayers. And in that specific case, no information was given to taxpayers that they were even registered. In fact, in that case, the Rwanda Revenue Authority looked back and decided to actually revert those registrations because they realized this, is not, um, this was not conducive for, for, for anyone. But this is the kind of mass campaign that we're looking at here. And we were able to uh, go back to the data and see if, if in months where there were so many registrations resulting from those mass campaigns, if those taxpayers were then more likely to be nil filers? And the answer was yes. So we could make that link between those mass registration campaigns and nil filing. 
The problem is once taxpayers are registered, not only they don't deregister, but also they're actively encouraged to actually file and file zero. So we have a tweet from the uh, RRA um, official Twitter channel saying, it's time to declare, do you have no income? File anyway, you can file zero everywhere because that is still prefer preferable than not filing altogether, which comes with penalties, even if your income is zero. Uh, or, um, uh, or of course, uh, including information that is, that is not correct. The other big theme that came out of the interviews is taxpayer confusion, compliance costs, and complexity. So there is a widespread belief that registration is required from the time you have a business idea, but that is not the case by law. So many of those hopeful taxpayers were registering at the beginning, they, they didn't have to necessarily. But also equally, if your income is below a certain minimum, it's a really blur blurry area whether you should or not submit a tax declaration because no tax is due anyway if you're below the minimum threshold. So there is no incentive for the tax administration to come after you because there's no revenue to be made there. At the same time, if you don't declare, you risk actually getting fined for not submitting a declaration even though you didn't evade any tax because you didn't owe any tax. So this all is creating quite a lot of complexity in addition to the deregistration procedure, which was in itself quite, uh, quite complex. And taxpayers were very confused about all of this, especially because the practice of tax administration was often very different from what the law was actually saying. Uh, but of course they need to go with the practice because they don't want to get fined even if that is not um, exactly the letter of the law. And of course, evasion came up as part of the explanation. So our uh, friends at the Rwanda Revenue Authority were right that evasion was a part of the explanation, but it, it was definitely not a major one. In fact, the major reason for new filing, as I said, lies in those aggressive registration campaigns and taxpayers' responses to a complex uh, and confusing tax system. Now, I'm uh, almost done. I just wanna reflect maybe um, very quickly on the implications of those results for, um, for policy. Uh, I think what those results uh, say is what many of uh, my colleagues also from the um, uh, International Center for Tax and Development are also saying, are also showing from other countries, which is that informality is a, not a binary uh, concept. Informal actors are very diverse. Uh, my colleagues Max Gallian and Vanessa van den Bogard have a really good uh, paper uh, making exactly that argument. Uh, but also it's a really imprecise concept with very little use for tax administration because uh, it actually it can actually be counterproductive by, by pushing tax administrators to go out and register uh, lots of taxpayers thinking there is lots of revenue to be made there, but there isn't any, any revenue to be made there. If we consider the informal sector as you know, small stalls and so on, uh, as opposed to uh, bigger firms and uh, wealthier individuals which are equally outside of the tax net, but often not involved in those mass registration campaigns. I also have a few concluding thoughts on RCTs, so I'm, I'm gonna go through it very quickly and then maybe this can be the basis of the discussion. Um, RCTs are a simple method, and in this case, it allowed us to identify causal effects. It also allowed us to have an impact on policy. Um, we, we had clear hypotheses, like in the case of mail filers, that we could test with this method. Um, we provided useful insights to the uh, revenue administration, some of these things they kept implementing afterwards. Having those studies allowed us to have an open dialogue with the uh, Rwanda revenue administration, which has kept going for about uh, 10 years now. And it helped and it contributed to the sensitization of um, policymakers to evidence-based decision-making. But of course, there are a number of important considerations uh, when running RCTs, which I'm not going to go into the details, but we can in the discussion part of this. And certainly because there are important implications, uh, considerations to be made before even running an RCT, and also important limitations, as, a, as researchers, we often need to move beyond uh, RCTs. And in the case of the Neil Filer study, if we hadn't moved beyond RCTs, we wouldn't have gotten the really important story, which is the one about registration campaigns. But also in some cases, RCTs are simply not possible. The study I mentioned before about taxpayer education, the Rwanda Revenue Authority did not want to randomize for very good reasons. And we just couldn't do that. We had to uh, come up with something else. But also RCTs, again, as in the case of tax morale, test a very specific thing. They don't, don't test the broader concept, which means that maybe we don't find an impact, not because something doesn't matter, but because the specific intervention did not work. 
And of course, there are bigger, uh, big policy questions unanswered, like, for example, the question about what to do in the longer term. Luckily, RCTs are only one of many methods. Uh, and as researchers, we need to use the full toolbox, uh, which in this case we did with uh, interviews, but also in other um, studies uh, related to this, we use focus group discussions, descriptive statistics, theory. Uh, we, of course, know a lot from theory and existing knowledge, and we definitely don't need to do RCTs at every move. That is not possible, is not desirable, uh, and we must learn from what we already know from other contexts, uh, so long as we adapted to, uh, to the specific uh, issues and programs we're looking at. So that's all I have for now. Thank you very much for listening. Um, Gil, I will pass it over to you for um, any questions that might have come up. Yeah, you need the microphone. Can see the microphone? Yes, online. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Really a, a very good uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, of course, in, in, in our discussions in UK evaluation, there's always that, that sort of doubt if RCTs are useful for complex interventions. And um, it's, it's obviously clear in your presentation that it's very useful to, um, to evaluate implementation modalities, uh, which, of course, has the advantage that the, 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 the the, you know, the, the treatment or the intervention which you, which you test is, 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 is smaller. Um, I was um, impressed by the 55% the uh, effectiveness uh, percentage which you, uh, which you gave. Um, so one of my questions is, uh, that, that's a huge effect size. Huh? Um, did the, the Rwanda Revenue Authority, um, not based on that, that a really strong effect that decide to send everybody an SMS um, after, yeah, based on, on your research, because it seems such a no-brainer not to do it uh, generally. So what was the, the, the learning process of this RCT within the Rwanda Revenue Authority, and, and why do they, or why they didn't they uh, roll out this intervention or implementation modality more general mm. in their activities? So, so that's a good question, and I could talk a long time about that because we had lots of discussions with the uh, uh, tax administrators about it. So, of course, they were very excited about this. Um, like in all low-income countries, it is a massive challenge to actually raise tax revenues, and and by doing something so simple, you can generate some additional revenue. I mean, six million is not going to be transformative for a country like Rwanda or any other country, but it helps, uh, and and it's a simple intervention. So yes, they have kept using uh, this method. Uh, they have kept reminding taxpayers of deadlines on a regular basis. In those conversations with the Rwanda Revenue Authorities, we were the ones saying you should be careful about uh, keep, keep, uh, um, about continuing to do it. And, and we tried to manage expectations a little bit about how much could actually come out of those nudges going forward. I think the reason why we got such a big effect in the first year is this was the first time this was done. This was new. As I said, we have um, lots of anecdotal evidence of taxpayers coming to the Revenue Authority saying, I received a letter, I, I received a message with my name on it. What have I, what have I done wrong? Um, and so it was, it was quite an event. As these messages become more frequent, taxpayers ignore them. Taxpayers start learning that there might not be much coming out of it. Um, and, um, and of course, the Revenue Authority needs to be thinking very carefully about how are those nudges complemented by other things, like actual traditional enforcement and audits, actual checks, uh, taxpayer education, and real things that happen that are not only nudges. So we were actually the, maybe our biggest critics in saying, you know, it was useful to test the concept. It was useful to learn something about tax compliance. It was useful to confirm the approach that the Revenue Authority had already taken to favor friendly approaches over aggressive enforcement. But that didn't mean that they should have kept doing it and expected 55% increase in compliance all the time. Um, so that, that's, that's what I would say. In fact, in other contexts, um, the effects are much smaller. So in higher income contexts, 
the effect is much smaller, which is consistent with more evasion in lower income countries than in higher income countries, as in the margin to actually respond to that uh, nudge is higher where there is more evasion. So the other um, experiment that was run similar to this in Ethiopia also finds very large effect sizes, much larger than what you find in the US, European countries and so on. So if I understand it correctly, th there was a repetition of the messaging in the day, in the years after, but then the effect size, uh, or at least the effects where you didn't do it in, a, in an experimental way in, in, in this, those follow-up years, or also, uh, do you have an effect size in those follow-up years? Can you indicate more or less what, how it diminished in time? So the, so when we go, so we did go back the following year, uh, and we did not find any effect of those who were nudged once the previous year. We also nudged uh, taxpayers again. And for taxpayers with an active tax liability, with a positive tax liability, we didn't see any additional effects. But we had various treatment arms. So now one of the specific arms was about new filers. So that is where we then went on to, to write the, the second paper there. And that's where we saw uh, an impact. But to run that follow-up, we had to ask the Rwanda Red Bean Authority to stop all the other messages they were running in those three months. Because if we send messages um, for, in the context of an RCT, but at the same time, the RRA also sends three other messages to remind them of deadlines, then, then the whole impact is confounded and it's, not, it's actually not even sensible to evaluate something like that. So we managed to do it the second year. I don't think it would even be possible to do it now unless you're able to stop everything else because now it became routine to send those messages out, at least the reminders, which taxpayers have appreciated a lot uh, over time. Thank you. Question here in the room. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I had a question about actually when you were running the RCT, um, how how large is the Rwanda Revenue Authority team that you were working with? How many of them actually knew what was going on? And because you said you had all these um, taxpayers who were coming in and asking mm -hmm. questions of who they were interacting with, how did they know how to respond? Or like in that sense, um, yeah, did they actually know what was happening? Was there a possibility then that some of the workers would, were telling their friends about what was going on, did that impact, like that type of thing. And then um, how you said, and just to clarify, half of, half of the taxpayers that received the messages didn't respond, right? What, how, what percentage of that was nil filers? Um, and then that will determine if I ask another question. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll start from the, from the first one about who knew about it and how big was the team. I wish my colleagues from the RRA were here to answer that question because they actually uh, wrote a paper about exactly that, uh, which is available on the ICTD website. Um, but the short answer is um, the research team at the Rwanda Revenue Authority is very small. It's now been expanded, but it was a couple of people back when we were doing this. So the people who were in the know were those couple of researchers in the research uh, function, the head of the research function, the relevant commissioner in charge of research and planning and statistics, uh, deputy commissioner general, commissioner general. And that was basically it. We had to brief everyone else because we had to tell everyone else taxpayers might be coming and you need to know what's happening. So what we told them is exactly what was happening, which is we are testing out a new communication campaign and we're sending those messages. They knew what the messages were looking like. In fact, it, were, it was tax officials delivering the messages, the physical letters. So everybody knew that this was happening. What they didn't know is that it was part of a study. Uh, so we briefed the um, uh, call center um, and we told them, you know, if they come, this is what's in the letter. You need to reassure them that this is not a letter about an audit. It's not a letter about anything they've done wrong. Um, it is about general information and you can help them check their accounts if needed, but, um, but uh, yes, it's not personalized on their situation in that sense. Your second question, um, many of those half that didn't respond, many of those are the new filers. So by far they're the biggest group in that, in that, um, in that portion that didn't respond to messages at all. I don't know if that sparks the second question after that or not. 
I think the the other thing would be about Rwandan law uh, based off of sorry Rwandan law based off of audits. So, for example, how far back do they go with an audit, and would it be a strategy for? It's like the idea of if I was evading, if I was not doing something, why would I change my behavior? Mm -hmm. Because that would spark, that would mean that I was doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. um, especially if their exit strategy out of the business is to nil file based off of like some countries have um, a certain number of years that they'll go back to audit. So I'm just wondering yeah. about that type of uh, motivation. Yeah. yeah. Like you're absolutely right. So you you would only respond to this message if you have margin to increase compliance. So we're not expecting. So if you're perfectly compliant, we're not expecting you would pay more than you owe because you received this message. So and that's where the size of the effect tells us something about how prevalent was evasion before. In fact, it's quite interesting. In a in a separate study in Ethiopia, we we were evaluating electronic billing machines in that case. But we then looked at whether the same nudge that we're using now had a different effectiveness for those who already had a billing machine, which communicates data straight to the revenue authority, so it already increases compliance. And in that case, we saw that the nudge was effective for those who didn't adopt the machine because they still had a margin to evade. And it was much less effective or not effective at all for those who had adopted the machine because in their case, they had already closed that margin for increasing compliance, maybe not entirely. But as much as they would have gone, as far as they would have gone there. And yeah, so it's do go back in time. Um, but because this was specifically done at the time of the declaration, we're, we expect particularly to see that. We did work with revisions as well, because taxpayers can revise their accounts. So the pilot was about revisions. Um, there is something to be said there, uh, but I think it's more salient when it's the actual declaration now. We have some questions um, from the online audience. So Michael uh, Masia from uh, Malawi he suggests some some ideas and perhaps you can reflect on it. One is um, uh, is there a room for for pre-populated tax returns uh, and the effect of that on compliance? And another idea that he had could be if you can combine um, data sets from the revenue authority with, for instance, customs declarations mm -hmm. and, and um, distill nudges from those uh, to show, hey, we know that you have imported something and you are still a nil nil fiber. Do you think it's feasible or is it possible to uh, implement that, be it as an experiment or in general? So we need a, lot, a long time to answer this question comprehensively. So please, Michael, let, let me so let's discuss those more comprehensively. But again, because there's a whole program, which is actually uh, Digitax, looking at many of those questions. So once you have all this data from um, administrative data from customs, but also from other organizations in government, like central bank or, or commercial banks and so on, can you use that information to improve compliance? Um, so there's lots of evidence. My colleagues here from Digitax, I'm sure, would be able to uh, add to what I'm uh, I'm about to say. So certainly there is scope to do those cross checks, and in terms of research, there is scope to use those cross checks combined with nudges. So you could, for example, cross check taxpayers' records, see there is a discrepancy, and send a targeted messages a message to taxpayers who have a discrepancy, saying, "Look." We're seeing this from your tax accounts. Can you please clarify? There is actually a study that did that uh, exactly in Ecuador. And what they found is that many taxpayers did not respond unless the nudge was complemented with traditional enforcement. So I, again, it's, it's similar to what we were discussing earlier. Yes, nudges are helpful, but something real needs to happen alongside the message or the communication. Um, in Rwanda, for example, at some point, those cross checks were done for VAT. So you could only uh, claim uh, for your VAT inputs if the transaction was reported by the seller. So that was aimed to reduce VAT fraud. Uh, that was successful. So revenue authorities do those kind of automatic cross checks all the time. You could potentially think about pre-populating returns with the data that you already have available. That is a good idea in principle. I think the only caveat is you would need to make sure that the information you have is actually accurate. Um, which is not necessarily the case all the times. Um, some policymakers might feel reluctant to put information and communicate it with taxpayers about their tax accounts because that might be seen as 
this is as much as you owe and and sort of a an approval of this is all you need to pay and and there's nothing more that you owe so these are things that revenue authorities are experimenting with everywhere uh, in Europe, in Africa, and in South Asia, everywhere. Um, and they can certainly be the subject of, um, of an experiment to the extent that you can pilot these things, see if they work with an experiment, and then maybe roll it out uh, if, uh, if there are no major concerns. Um, there are some other questions. Uh, we also, time wise, we are two o'clock, so uh, I think we need to, to wrap up. A little bit. Uh, there are three questions, and they are perhaps um, possible to, to respond on. One is about the sustainability of your methods or recommendations, which you reflected a little bit on, but uh, perhaps um, explain again what, what's the difference of before and after your research on the on the practices of the revenue of the Rwanda Revenue Authority. Um, the second question is. Um, uh, suggesting that perhaps Iran is a bit of an exception because deterrence messages seem to work in other contexts uh, far better. So is it is it something which has to do with the context of Rama uh, that might explain that? And the third question is uh, more practical about what was the the ratio of delivery agents over the target population. Um, did uh, the Rwanda Revenue Authority hire additional staff mm -hmm. for physical delivery of yeah. those letters or of the, uh, the, the, the treatments which you um, experiment? Yeah, I'm going to respond quickly because I also don't want to keep people very much over time, um, but I think it is possible to do quick answers. So on the deterrence one, uh, it's true our results are not in line with the literature, but it's also true once we take off uh, the large taxpayers, they are very much in line with the literature. So it's only that it's only that deterrence is not effective for those larger taxpayers, but for everybody else, it is the expected result. Um, and the, this result on backfiring for larger taxpayers has been found in at least another couple of studies. So, so I think once the nuance is taken into account, you know, it, we're, we're still speaking to, to results that have um, have been found elsewhere. Um, the Rwanda Revenue Authority did not hire uh, additional staff to deliver letters. They were able to handle it with the team they already had, but we also had didn't have that many letters. So we had uh, SMS and, um, and emails as well. In other contexts on the African continent where similar studies were run, um, it, it can be done by the post office, by independent enumerators. There is a question about sustainability, which is the first question, slightly different, about what do you do going forward. In the case of Rwanda, they didn't do letters, they did SMS. It was useful to test letters as well, because that showed us that actually it wasn't worth continuing with the letters. Um, so many studies that followed uh, this one actually went on to do uh, emails or SMS. Because again, there's no reason why one should try a method that is not anyway very effective. So it can be done even without additional capacity. And sustainability, I, I think the, the fact that the results didn't last beyond the first year is already something that needs to be thought about in terms of what are the complementary policies in addition to those uh, communication campaigns and nudges uh, that can actually uh, yield a longer lasting behavioral change in, in the longer term, taxpayer education. Um, actual checks, traditional enforcement methods, and so on. Then I think we are at the end of the, of the seminar. I, I think it was fascinating to, uh, to hear about the, the insights that you, you got through the RCT and also the new hypothesis which were generated by perhaps non-significant but indicative coefficients in your regressions. Uh, which is especially something which I like a lot, the, the, the reanalysis of information and to just to understand what type of groups are responding compared with others or why do some respond to interventions and others not instead of only looking at the average effect. And so thank you very much for this and the audience and also the online audience. Um, so we will be back uh, after the summer, the, the UK summer holiday with, uh, with new CDI seminars in September, October. We'll uh, get you informed. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thanks, guys, for giving me a compliment. Mm -hmm. <laughs>